All right, everybody. Welcome to the June 2020 SAN coordinator call. Um, if you were expecting the chord of C, you're not getting it. You're getting a chord of G, but you're getting a really great lineup today. Starting off, we have Beverly Wade from University of the Pacific. Anytime there's a craziness with state regulations, as there was during the rapid shift to online learning, we always think about our California friends and we always want to hear from them anyways from time to time. So Beverly's going to update us a little bit on what it looks like uh, in state to state California now. Beverly, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, so as Dan said, he wanted me to take a look from a California perspective and from the higher ends through the lens of higher ed, regulations really have not changed. Um, there's been no alleviating of physical presence, definitions, anything of that nature. But what I have noticed in my experience is that if a agency, a higher ed agency has any time restrictions, like if you need to get in your application at a certain time, they may have extended that time. And I'm thinking in this case, specifically Maryland, they've done that. They have still been accepting <coughs> applications. They're processing it and doing all of that, but they're giving institutions more time to get the paperwork in. And what has also happened with COVID, regardless of where your institution is located, is that it has definitely impacted funding. This has been um, an event that has been very um, impactful in that area. So for my institution specifically, and I'm sure for some other California institutions, leadership is asking questions around whether or not it is wise for us to seek authorization in certain states, especially some of the states that it may be much more expensive for us to get that authorization in. So the return on investment piece becomes much more robust conversation through which um, those conversations are taking place. I especially am very thankful that DOE has given us flexibility in our implementation of distance learning solutions through the end of the year so that we can continue having these conversations of having our state authorization plan of where we are going to seek authorization, seeing how things are going to play out in the fact of whether or not we may need to back, go back to sheltering in place and just for things to settle down and to see if there's a cycle that is going to be established of how things are going to be done. Now, the place in which we've seen a lot of changes is around health sciences. The institution that I work with, we have um, a lot of professionals around that point, and we are developing a health school. So some states, such as Washington, has responded to COVID by activating an emergency response licensure law. And basically what that says is that volunteers can come to the state and that they do not need to get licensed specifically from Washington, that they will recognize their license from other places or other states states such as California, New York, and Michigan, they did temporary or emergency licenses in which they alleviated some of the thresholds that they had for licensure so that um, people can be up to speed quicker. And what they also did was that they encouraged practitioners that had recently retired, as well as students that had recently graduated, or those that were close to graduation, to then go ahead and come in to bring in their professionalism um, with them. I am sure that many of you, your governors were giving updates on a daily basis or on a regular basis as how COVID was going, was being, and the what's developing in New York State and then what the responses were. But what Governor Newsom did 
a few months ago that I really appreciated is that he really thanked the California Community Colleges because he's seen, data has shown that up to 70% of our first rep responders in the state have gone through the community college system. And so if there's any California Community Colleges on the line, thank you guys so much for the work that you do because we're seeing it in our daily lives being impacted. And then just as a reminder, for those of us that as we're talking to our programs and to students, especially around professional licensure, is to please make sure that you are really stressing to them how important it is that as they're doing their internships, is that they are wearing their PPEs. We are noticing an uptick in complaints and it is around the either not using PPEs or using them incorrectly. So just to help protect our students. And then finally, as campuses are looking to reopen, I am sure that you will see on your at your institution that they will be instituting waivers of liability to any event that may be taking place. And basically that is saying that the person, the individual is responsible for their own safety and actions. They are acknowledging that while they may be coming to an event on your campus, they will have an increase of exposure and that they may get sick, but that they will hold the institution not liable. And that's all I have unless you have questions. Everly, that questions. was fantastic. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you very much that you 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 asked a lot, you you gave us a lot of things. So I do have some questions to try to mm -hmm. unpack this great information that you shared. Um, so first of all, just starting with um, state compl individual institution compliance. So uh, institutional approval, the first step, you know, the state right. authorization of your institution in the states where you have activities. Are you seeing an uptick in um, programs that may not have been aware, you know, because you've worked by and large with the distance education program. So the ones that are kind of know that they have online programming, but we're talking about face-to-face -face programs, typical face-to-face -face programs that had to do the pivot so right. are you seeing them surprised that, you know, we have, you know, some issues in regard to state compliance where the students should be located, are located? Um, I'm just wondering what you're seeing in terms of your communication with programs. Um, surprise and horror, yes. Um, <laughs> and it, with the surprise and horror is the good thing with that is that, um, yes, these are conversations that I've tried to have over the years, but the good thing is that I do not need to let them know what the DOE um, statement is because they know it better than I do at this point. And so <laughs> they may tell me that, oh, Beverly, we don't need to worry about this because remember, Department of Ed said that we're fine on this until the end of the year. So in some ways, it helps to ease some of the anxiety, but it also lets them know that this is something that we seriously need to look at. Um, and like I said, with the restricted funding, at this point, I don't know how to always necessarily navigate that conversation because, okay, the position, and I'll talk specifically about my institution here because that's where I know the most. Um, in the county that UOP is located in, California right now is experiencing an uptick in COVID-19 cases. And specifically in the county that our institution is located, there's also an uptick. So even though our institution is talking about opening back in fall, that is a best case scenario. We don't know if that's really going to happen or not. What that, they're talking about what that looks like is that, we will need to be screened on a daily basis. We will need to wear masks the entire time that we're on campus. What Governor Newsom says is that he does not want us back at full force. So that means staggering people's schedules and all of that. So there's a lot of moving pieces and where the school is very concerned about whether or not 
students will be back on campus and then what that looks like or if they're going to go somewhere else. So that's a lot of the conversation right now. And then when you're throwing in state authorization on top of that, it just becomes that much more. But I appreciate that you that you brought that up and you also brought up the, the flexibility, but I think it's really important to express that the flexibility is just in terms of Title yes. IV compliance. Yes. So the institution is still in, has a responsibility to the state because that's where the consumer protection aspects come in. I so, agree. So, yeah. so I know we've been sharing that the institution should be aware um, of where their students are located for the purposes of making sure that they have communicated with that state. And we've got Cheryl Thompson on the call too, and I'm going to call on her in just a second because she reviewed um, a number of states and, and got a mixed bag of what, what states were saying to institutions that were not participating in reciprocity in terms of um, what they needed to do that was temporary, what they needed to do that is permanent. And um, it, as those of us who did this work pre Sarah recall, it's all over the place. Yes. And so it still remains all over the place. And mm -hmm. so Cheryl, can I call on you for a sec to, to just kind of give us a general understanding of what you saw? Sure. So what I did, this was early on in this pandemic business. Um, I reached out to the states that pre sara and non sara institutions currently um, need to pay attention to because they do regulate having online students in the state. And my I e contacted each of them individually by email asking them if they were enforcing that particular regulation during this national emergency time. And you're right, Cheryl, I got a mixed response. Some uh, states replied back that no, they would not be taking action on that particular thing during this emergency. Some said it would be, um, they would not take action up until a certain point in time. Um, others, I was rather surprised, others said, we are still enforcing this. Um, so that's, that's out there. <laughs> So some states that do regulate online students are still expecting institutions to seek authorization if any of their campus-based students had to move to or relocate to uh, a particular state during this time when the campuses were closed. Uh, like I said, I was really surprised that some were still going to move forward with that, but there are a few. And that makes sense if they're concerned about consumer protection. So what we've been advocating with institutions, and I'm sure Beverly, you're all over this, is good documentation. Can't say that enough. So if you're having to make adjustments um, based on the pandemic, that make sure that um, it is well documented and why. So that, you know, should we come to a point where you need to be able to share that, you've got it documented of what the steps were that you took and why you took them. So thank you very much, Cheryl, for, sh for saying that. And the other thing that Beverly shared that I thought was really uh, important too was about, okay, there was institutional approval. That was the standard state authorization, if you will. But if you're talking about professional licensure programs, we're also talking about possible program approval and different aspects that licensing boards are doing. And you can find... Um, Several of the licensing boards have been very good about sharing information, and you can find links to that on the homepage of the SAN website. We have, um, we have uh, combined, we've collated um, a number of national associations for state licensing boards. We have program accreditors, and we have institutional accreditors. So you can find lists of some of the accommodations, waivers, flexibilities um, that they've been able to offer um, during the times of the pandemic. And yes, many of them are extending those times um, to move forward. Um, and we have a good question here. Do we have a list of those that are, that are not easing their state authorization enforcement during the pandemic? The issue is this, we have some, some states, some state higher ed agencies that um, do, not have, uh, do not have oversight of online only, but they could have um, oversight of not online, but experiential learning. And then there are those who have um, no, no um, 
no oversight over any of the activities, uh, California is one of them, of a public institution or a private nonprofit that's out of state providing distance education, including experiential learning. So there's a real variety. So the place to go um, for the most up-to-date information at this point is the state authorization guide. You'll find that on the NC Sara website. On the NC Sara website, you look to the top right and you'll see up in their header, the state authorization guide. Click on that. And it's just like uh, the old SHEO surveys, but updated. So uh, you can find information. Um, uh, Mary, I see you adding something. Mary, could you pop on and explain what you're sharing? Oh, sorry. I was just asking. Glad you did. Um, uh, wanna, you know, and I, I'm coming at this from both perspectives. And Beverly, I apologize if you're not if you don't have this. But she did such a great job of outlining what the steps were. And I was just wondering if she had a cheat sheet that maybe we could, that you could add to your site for people that um, were not able to be on this call because it was just a fantastic summary of, of what's happening in California. So um, I'll pop off. I didn't mean to. No, no, no. Glad you did. Thank you very much. Sorry. Actually, we've got Dan diving into that as well right now because we appreciate what Cheryl did. Um, you know, for the institutions she was working with, and we're and we're also trying to look at where we are as we move into the fall semester. So we're taking the great stuff that Cheryl did, looking back into some um, of the state agencies and what they're doing. Um, and Sherry Miller explains that DC is operating normally, no extensions. New Mexico has granted some flexibility. Yes, we've got a variety of these. Thanks for sharing that, Sherry. You'll see that in the chat. Um, but we do see that there's a variety of um, requirements that are still in place. And again, we're, we're talking consumer protection. So that's why the states are still requiring what they do. Um, thank you very much, Beverly. It's a complicated topic. I appreciate that you brought in the institutional approval versus the program approval. So we make those distinct and uh, let people know, you know how things are being viewed at this point. Thank you very much for being on and thank you for the contributions, uh, Mary and Cheryl. Dan, do you have any, I, I totally took over. Do you have any questions that you wanted to ask as well? I just had a question, Beverly, about the waivers. This was this is a little off topic, but just curious. Um, you said there there was gonna be waivers for activities. Is that, what, what's meant by activity there? No, no, that was more like from an institutional standpoint. Uh, one of the concerns that I've um, always had is that if we are going to be having events on our campuses, right, is how are we going to make sure it's our liability <laughs> to the people that are coming on campus. And so what I'm seeing, starting to see is that um, it's around the events, whether it's a sporting event, whether it's um, just whatever, that they may um, ask people to sign off on a waiver, releasing them from liability in case they get sick. We have started to hear a few of these inside higher ed has been uh, indicating that some institutions are, are wanting to move in that direction maybe as we look into fall. So that's, that's a real interesting um, thing that they're all discussing at this point. So thanks for bringing that up too, for us to be aware. Yep, and I, did, I didn't mean to divert because I know that's not really in the state authorization side, but it was it's interesting. Um, well, Cheryl, we're up to you here for coordinator, unless, unless there are any other comments or questions on this, which I don't see, um, is coordinator bring a friend to the call day. Well, I just, I just had wondered if anyone was able to bring somebody from their institution onto the call today. We typically keep these calls to um, the coordinators, but given that it's June, a lot of people are trying to take some time at this point. We thought, well, might, might be a, a good time to see if anybody wanted to bring a staff member with them onto the call. Did we have anybody today that was able to do that, that wants to share and introduce their person? Ah, you guys are holding on to that link tightly and not sharing at your institution, I see. I'm just kidding. Um, we'll try this again sometime. Uh, we just want to be able to, 
to uh, give you all the opportunity to let others at your institution see what our calls entail. Um, it is helpful. We have some rather large memberships that might want to invite somebody that's from another institution that's under the umbrella of that um, membership so that they can see what a coordinator call is like. Um, or ask their questions. So, so we'll try this again. Um, we'll throw it out there and see if, if others would like to do it at another time. So I'll just go ahead and, and introduce uh, Cheryl Thompson. We've got the Sensational nominations open. Um, they're self nominations and they're opening, they're open now. You can go to the SAN website. We've got the hyperlink there that Dan's provided and the nominations opened just the other day and will be open for a month. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl and, and let her talk a little bit about the Sensational nominations. Thank you, Cheryl, and hi to everybody. Um, most of you have probably heard of this before, but we're happy to announce that the nominations are open now for the Sensational Award for 2020. Um, the tendency always is, I think, that institutions think, well, what we did wasn't that big a deal or, you know, that kind of thing. But again, I want to encourage you, as I have other times, to send in a nomination. Um, we have three different categories this year, and they're kind of broad. And so that's good for you that it could be a number of things within the category that you submit. Um, what the first topic is about licensure programs. What has your institution done or are you doing regarding notifications and disclosures for professional licensure status um, in, the, in each of the states? What actions have you taken or that kind of thing? Uh, the next topic is about location and data reporting. How do you d identify where your students are located? Maybe you've just gone through a process uh, where you've defined terms and you've set up your databases to do this work and to meet the federal regulations that go into effect now on July 1. And um, there again, you can describe what you've done and how it has benefited or how you expect it will benefit your institution. Um, the third one is compliance innovations. And this is even more broad in that it's anything that your institution has done in the way of policies or tools or forming teams or any other uh, thing or project that you have taken on in the compliance world for state authorization or professional licensure that uh, you have found as a, as a success or you're just starting it or you're, you know, you're planning for it. It can be any of those things. Um, the le this is the second year now that we are providing an actual template for your nomination, which I think will make, make it easier than earlier years. Uh, so you just fill in the template with the information that's requested and it's all submitted electronically with a form uh, that's on the website. Uh, and again, you have until July 17th to submit your nominations. And I strongly encourage, no matter what type or what size institution you are from, uh, feel free to participate in this. It's a, it's a good activity for you internally. It also gives you recognition externally. And so, um, we're looking forward to seeing some great nominations this year again. Thanks. That was great, Cheryl. Uh, really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, Cheryl was one of the uh, original creators of the Sensational Awards, and we really appreciate that she has served on our Sensational um, Review Committee along with Jeannie Yaki Fine all these years that we've been holding the Sensational Awards. So uh, we're really grateful for their interest in the development of uh, new strategies to um, manage state authorization compliance. So thanks, Cheryl. Okay, wow. moving forward, me again. Uh, sand workshops. Okay, guys, here we are. It is, uh, we are hearing about budget crunches. We are hearing about travel restrictions. And um, we had previously moved the June workshop, which should have taken place last week, last week, two weeks ago, uh, recently <laughs> to September. It was to be a basics workshop. We just made the decision to move our back to basics workshop in September to virtual. And uh, at this time, we have contacted the registrants who um, we already had a, a good number 
that had registered for that workshop and to turn it into a virtual workshop that meets the same quality standards that we uh, wish to keep, we are going to intentionally keep it small. If everyone that had already registered decides to um, move to the virtual format, then we will not open up any more seats. Um, if some decide that that's not their cup of tea, understand that, and then we will open up those seats. So you will be hearing from us in the next week or so. Um, we have heard from about two thirds of the current registrants um, and all of them so far are willing to move with us to the virtual, um, virtual uh, format. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, but it'll be our first time and, and it's not like the virtual seminars that we've created and posted on the website. This is meant to be very interactive as those of you that have participated in our workshops know we put the work in workshops. Um, it's an interactive thing. We have you talking to people and going away with actionable um, steps for your institution. So that's the basics workshop. Now you may be saying, well, Cheryl, what about an advanced topics workshop? Well, we're already talking about that. Um, I don't know, Dan and I have talked a little bit. We don't know what the exact topic of the advanced topics workshop will be because you know we try to make sure it's timely, but we will do one in the winter and it will be virtual. We will not be holding in-person workshops um, in this academic year. However, we will have the same um, uh, idea of um, very personal workshops and we'll go back up to the normal size when we do the advanced topics workshop in the winter. Um, we just wanted this first basics workshop to be small so that we can test out tools and make sure they're working well and give personal attention to the new folks who needed the basics workshop. But our advanced topics workshop, again, very personal, but it'll be back up to our normal size and it will be in the winter and you'll be hearing more about that as we proceed into fall. Let's see, we have some questions here. Okay, um, Yolanda asked about waivers. We're gonna get to those. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, and uh, so we will um, be talking more about what these workshops entail and um, you'll be seeing if we open up for um, the virtual for September, we will be in communication with the whole with the whole membership to offer those few last spots. Um, otherwise, we'll be talking again about advanced topics workshop as we move into the fall about a winter workshop. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Well, just one one last thing there is is on the advanced topics. Um, if 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 anyone of you has ideas for things that you're seeing or that you and some of your colleagues or, or groups are seeing. Um, let us know. Um, we 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 um, try to keep our our finger on the pulse, so to speak. But um, we also aren't on campus anymore, so we really do rely on you guys. So if there are things bubbling up that we're not seeing, please let us know. We want this to be relevant. Um, and speaking of relevant, coming up from July sixth to the seventeenth is the nomination for the Sand Advisory Group. One, one slot open for a two year term and the voting will be July 20th to 29th. I believe I mentioned it last time, but I really do hope to get some great, um, some great nominations for that group. They are the official pulse and representative body for the SAN membership, but of course we expect, accept and encourage and really thrive on participation from everyone. Um, sort of similar to that, I will then now Welcome the new coordinators that we have since our last call. So we have Steve Peterson from Truman State University, Stephen Barrett from University of Wyoming, Thomas Vu from AICCU, and Sheridan Miller from the New England Board of Higher Ed, Rachel Stokopiak from the New England Board of Higher Ed, Emily Jacobson from MEC, and Sarah Appel from MEC. So we are excited. For all of you and if you know any of these folks please give them a welcome. Cheryl I'm going to kick it back to you to talk about mix. Well Dan before I do that I'm going to uh, ask you a question about sharing with folks how they will find the self nominations and what kinds of things should they be kind of thinking about before the self nomination forms are made available for them to submit. So we'll post to mix and on the SAN website as well when they are available. 
Um, we're going to be using a form this year, and I can actually preview the questions for you if I can just find my. form here um it's relatively straightforward and there's no there's no requirement except that you um are a part of this group so the the the, the ballot so the the uh, um nomination form is um still under draft but you're going to be asked for to think about what is one way that the sand advisor Sand advisory group that enhance collaboration among the members. What book have you most enjoyed reading in the last year? And if you could only have one of the following superpowers, which would it be flight or invisibility? So it's basically a three question, a three question um, form. One of them really gets to the heart of, of what we do. The other two are to give a chance to people to get to know you a little bit better. So those are the three questions, and um, we look forward to some fast, fantastic um, nominations. I think it's important to point out that uh, there is only one available position moving forward into the next year. Um, the uh, members of the advisory group hold a term, and uh, there's only one person's term that ends this summer. And so there is just one, um, one spot available at this time. This is not the only opportunity to volunteer within SAN. Um, you know, we had just uh, had um, an opportunity to join the professional licensure group and the work group. And then we will have another work group that'll be starting in the fall that will be the subject of the upcoming up and open forum. We'll have Tyson Heath talking with everyone about the new special interest team on institutional engagement. So we, we are trying to create you know, more opportunities for you all to uh, communicate with each other and, um, and build uh, new resources that will be available for um, the network. So um, advisory group is just one way and uh, we look forward to those that wish to do that. It is not a requirement that you be a coordinator to be in the SAN advisory group. It could be um, any contact at an institution that's a part of SAN. So it doesn't have to be a coordinator, but you may wanna consider others at your institution or yourself. Um, but that, uh, that nomination form will be made available, as Dan said, on the SAN website, and then we will send it out in WCET Mix. Okay, so WCET Mix. Um, those of you that have been with us for a while may recall that we used something that we just kind of generically called the listserv. And it had a way to search for previous posts, but it was much more clunky than um, what we have today. Um, so we changed to WCET Mix um, and it's uh, Higher Logic is the company that runs it. We've just named it WCET Mix, obviously. And uh, so I'm gonna put this on my screen. Dan, can you see it? Yep, I can see it. Okay, great. Okay, so that link that was on there, and I'll, I'll move it back to the agenda in a minute, but this is the main uh, homepage for WCET Mix. And so if you would like to review, so we have communities, okay? Most of you, um, if you are participating in WCET, you'll see different WCET um, communities, but most of you are definitely in SAN coordinators and SAN network. So let's say you wanted to uh, look back at some of the previous discussions that we've had with the, with the SAN network. You'll see the different topic areas under thread subject. And so you can go back and review some of the different um, things that we've talked about. So NC Sarah policy change. Um, you can see the interactions that I had evidently with uh, a variety of folks explaining um, a board change that NC Sarah just announced. So there are, so not only can you comb through your emails, which is sometimes difficult, you can go straight to the um, WCET mix and see the different thread subjects. Um, if you would like to participate by 
this function, you can go post a message. And the other thing that I think is really helpful about this is people are always wondering, well, how can I communicate with somebody if I don't have their email address? Well, if you know their name, you can look up their name here and you can send a direct message to the variety of people that are part of the SAN network. And the same goes for the SAN coordinators. So if you wanted to find somebody within the SAN coordinator list, you can go find them in the listing of all the SAN coordinators. So you have different ways to be able to communicate with the other, other members of our, of our, uh, of our SAN community. So um, I think that's really helpful. And then we have libraries. And as, as we have more um, things that people wish to post, um, we, our library will expand, you know, to show the, the new um, attachments that have been part of um, some of the folks' posts. So this is a great tool. It houses the information that we've been discussing before, as opposed to just going straight through um, your, um, your email, because who knows, in Outlook, it's, it's so difficult to find. So this should be very helpful. Um, any questions about how to use Mix? Well, hopefully that was really straightforward. Um, you'll see that I posted, and we'll start to post this under our resources too, but I posted it on the agenda, and I'll post it in uh, future, um, E newsletters so that you know this is where you go if you want to start tracking down um, different posts. So if you are also a member of WCET, you can, it's the same place. So you can find where the conversations were around certain areas uh, for um, WCET. WCET, WCET has um, discuss and news. And so ours is SAN network, SAN network community and coordinators. So they use Discuss, like we use SAN Network, to have um, uh, interactions with each other. And I strongly urge, Dan and I have both been strongly urging you to communicate with each other because we think that trying to problem solve together is really helpful. So um, anyway, so uh, is it password protected? Um, yes, you had to uh, already be a part of this. You had to be added um, to be, a, Dan and I have to add you to Higher Logic to be a part of this. So, um, so it's not just an open, open forum for anyone. Um, it is restricted. That was a good question. Any other questions? Okay, so we have other business as our next item. And I just wanted to, um, to ask if, uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny, we've got July 1 coming around the corner uh, next week. And so our members seem to be pretty on top of it. I've been very impressed with the interactions that we've all had about, um, you know, that doesn't mean that everybody has it all nailed down yet, but we're all working very hard um, towards the requirements um, for, you um, uh, professional licensure and, and being in compliance with the new federal regulations. And I thought I would just give this opportunity, since we've got a few extra minutes, if there are any pressing questions that any of you all wanted to bring onto this call today. Okay, that's great. Um, we have been trying to provide a number of resources. Um, I have learned through um, a couple of different channels that the handbook um, has been um, has been something that was uh, very uh, helpful to a number of institutions that aren't even members of SAN. We opened up some of our SAN resources due to COVID. We opened up a little sooner than we would have normally, um, but we thank Sherry Miller for the great work she did in putting together the handbook um, that people are finding as a very practical guide um, for, um, for state authorization, um, professional licensure compliance. So Dan, I'm gonna turn it over to you and if you could maybe tell everybody a little bit about the upcoming up open forum. I'm sure, well, Cheryl alluded to it helpfully before, but um, we have a new special interest team on institutional engagement. And what that is, is an, a, um, it's one thing to know what all the regulations say, 
but it doesn't do your institution a whole lot of good if it's not implemented. And it's not implemented or it's not implemented as well as it could be. And that's, it's not really uh, necessarily on, our, on us, on you guys, because you're generally typically not the decision makers. But what you need to do, what we all know we need to do is to be doing everything we can to engage the higher, the higher ups at our institutions, the ones who do make the decisions to be as fully informed and to be as, um, as, uh, have it with as much buy-in as possible. And so this, is, this idea of this SIT, of the special interest team, is to help SAN membership develop resources and skills to help advocate for these issues and to help get the message across to the people who do end up signing on the dotted line. So um, Tyson Heath is gonna be from Western Governors, who's a longtime contributor and longtime coordinator is going to be writing up a short two or three sentence summary of this, of the goal of this SIT, and then he, and then he will be available on the open forum on July 14th to at, answer any questions about it, and hopefully um, you guys will, 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 will get interested. So we're really looking forward to this. It's a slightly different tact. Most of our open for our two special interest teams so far have been very focused on or I should say more focused on specific regulatory content. This is, this is a little bit more on skill building. So this can help regardless of what your knowledge of the topic is. Uh, this is really, in theory, could be applicable to the entire membership. That's certainly our goal. That's great. I, th I, I appreciate that this is going to be an opportunity. Um, I think it'll provide our, um, our membership with some I, again, we try to help with strategy building. So, you know, skill building, strategy building, um, you know, uh, to be able to comply uh, with the um, requirements that are put in front of us. So this is this is a great opportunity. Um, uh, with just a few minutes left, or does anybody else have any uh, new items that were not listed here? Well, Dan, I'll let you sum it up for the day and uh, we'll let people have 15 minutes back of their life. What could be better than that? All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you next month. Take care, everyone. Thanks for being with us.